Okay, welcome back. So we've got Sean uh, MacLebraid, uh, again, a good friend of the band. Um, he's going to talk to us this afternoon about denial of service kind of stuff and the idea that um, packets go <laughs> the blinky boxes blink and machines in general go beep. So, Sean, over to you, mate. Hi, how are you? My name's Sean. As it was kindly introduced by uh, 30 hours out of sleep, I completely forgot your name. I'm so sorry. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm uh, Sean, otherwise known as Mickle Braid or Calamity Sound, the pandemic man, because it's the best rhyming name ever. And this is my talk called Dossing About Packets Go Brrrr. Uh, so before we actually really get started, I kind of want to give a brief introduction about myself to sort of let know people who I am, because it's going to be weird halfway through the talk. It's like, wait, who is this guy again? So. Uh, as I mentioned, I am Michael Braid or Calamity Sam, the pandemic man. Uh, I was the past vice chairman, uh, vice chairperson in my uh, my hacker society in TU Dublin Blanchestown. That's a docs. Um, I am one of the moderators over at the Many Hats Club. Uh, I'm the one who's known to got really drunk one day on a bus when everybody decided to change their names. And I thought, like, I'm just going to ban all of you. I am power. So, yeah. Totally didn't nearly get me lose my moderatorship that way. Stu, Stu is watching this and he's just like, well, there you go, Sean, you're done. Um, uh, I was a digital forensics and cybersecurity student at TU Dublin. Um, as I was saying, I was also the vice chairperson there, but uh, I recently just graduated as well, actually. Uh, so now I'm just jobless and poor and... I'm also from Ireland. Uh, that means I'm a uh, Euro trash. So, you know. But now that I've gotten all the boring sort of stuff, like the whole like, hey, hire me. I need a job, please. Uh, <laughs> we're going to get to who I really actually am. So. As my friend Cyber Viking likes to put it, I drink goodly or I dance goodly. I drink better, but I'm not generally a dick and I'm an all right guy. I bribed him. Uh, I used to be in a couple of bands. Uh, I was in a, my last band was about three years ago, we were called, no, three, four years ago, we were called The Suppressors and I played the bass uh, because guitar is hard and uh, I had imposter syndrome with guitar. I have too many instruments. I have an electric guitar. I have two acoustic guitars. I have a mandolin. I have a problem. Um, I should really stop wasting my money on instruments. Actually, I also have a little bird thing that if you dip it in water, right, you, you blow into it and it sounds like an actual tweed bird. It's the coolest thing. They wouldn't let me put on any albums if I ever got the chance though, so. Um, I was originally a bartender, as you can tell by the fact that I'm an alcoholic. Uh, I used to, I've worked all over the place. Um, I don't have any Vietnam flashbacks or anything, especially when uh, Dan Khan brought up nightclubs. Not at all. And I love an L point and I love to have the crack, so. Also, 10 points for the person who knows what the, uh, the actual gift there was a reference to. So just a quick agenda so you know what the actual crack is going on. Uh, I'm going to give just a little, I'm going to start off by giving a quick history of kind of like DOS and DDoS and all that sort of crack. And then I'm going to give you an idea of what the difference between all the DOS is. And then I'm going to give you a brief reason why I'm actually sort of doing this thing and not just make it feel like I'm just talking absolute shite for about 30 minutes or so, because I can just do that on my own. I don't really need the excuse. Um, I'm going to go through a few different types of dust and I'm going to give an idea of some sexy tools that you can use, but don't actually use because that's illegal. Uh, some mitigation techniques, a few examples. And then if we have the time, we'll have a minute silence for the fact that the Dublin bars were this close two days away from opening again. So yeah. Anyway, let's get started. Uh, this is just sort of an a brief abridged history. And there's probably someone looking at this. It's just like, that's not the first one because from all the research I was doing, everybody seems to have a more like newer sort of DOS or DDoS going around. Uh, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if somebody's about to email me in about 10 minutes. It's like, no, the first DOS happened at the time of Thermopylae when they came, no, not Thermopylae, when the Battle of Marathon, when they came around and got all the Persians. That's not a DOS, that's a battle, that's history. Get, get used to it. So anyway, the first uh, DOS or the first DOS was uh, supposedly originally in 1974 by a 13-year-old called David Dennis. So basically, David Dennis was uh, is a school was a student in a 
was this a high school university? It was a weird name. I think he was using it to probably cover his own uh, OPSEC. Uh, so basically, he was a t he had a bit of interest in computers at the time, and he he went over to the uh, I have my notes here. Sorry, uh, the Computer Education Research or CERL or Computer Education Research and Squiggly Line Laboratory. I'm very good at writing. Um, went over there, found out the machines over there had this command called ext, which basically was, and don't correct, uh, you can correct me if you want, I'm probably getting shouted at, this is gonna be the wrong command, but it's ext basically was a, a shutdown command back in the day or to process a shutdown command, but there wasn't a uh, proper um, sort of authorization uh, sat on the computers. So basically he went in with, I'm assuming a floppy disk, so I went onto one of the computers, basically typed in this command, sent it or wrote a script, put it onto one of the computers, and just watched as about half of all the computers shut down midway through use. Uh, another example of a DOS attack would be, um, well, there's one of the first a DOS, I keep saying first, because of obviously the reason that I said before, where it's a bit like, is it the first or is it the second? Who actually knows? Uh, so there was a DOS attack in between September 6th and September 10th in 1996 in New York. Basically, a company called Panix, which is an ISP at the time, was hit by a Synflood, a Synflood not Synflood, that's a gang, um, Synflood DOS attack, where, uh, where basically they shut down the company for, I believe, no, look, <laughs> 36 hours. And they were using that time when they actually shut it down. They were domain hijacking and they were trying to get access to the mail, the news, the website and all that sort of stuff. Uh, basically, just overwhelm the computer and just tuck her out, you know, yourself. Uh, the first DDoS actual presentation was actually done in DEF CON. So if there's anybody from DEF CON, never been, I live in Europe, so you know yourself. Uh, it was done by a guy called Can C. Smith during DEF CON in 1997. He basically disrupted the entirety of the, the internet along the strip of Las Vegas. Uh, from that, the sample code was released from that actual presentation, which led to uh, several attacks happening with Sprint, Erdlink, and E-Trade. And then... Last but not least on the history of somebody's going to message me and tell me I'm completely wrong and I'm fine with that because I'm wrong 90% of the time, 100% of the time, um, was the first large-scale DDoS attack, which happened in August 1999, where basically disabled the University of Minnesota, which I originally wrote as Minnesotas because I was thirsty at the time. Um, I can't believe I have to keep looking at my notes. I swear I was learning this. Uh, basically shut it down with a UDP flood, but... Uh, use it with the tool of Trino, which was basically it would um, fragment it or that it would obfuscate the packets and make it look like it was actually, it didn't keep with the same exact tap. It would make the, the traffic look a little bit different. So it would look a little bit more realistic. Anyway, we'll move on and I'll accept all your emails if you tell me I'm wrong, I'm fine with it. So I just want to give you a basic idea what a DDoS and a DOS is because when I was originally starting and I realized I put DOS for distributed denial of service as well, but you know yourself, I was up 30 hours. Um, I wrote that one before, so you know. Um, so basically, the difference between a, a denial of service and a distributed denial of service is basically, a denial of service is an attack that comes from a single source. It is also used for flooding targets until they basically collapse or can they can use the time to actually gain access to that machine by basically like creating this sort of traffic to hide everything else that's happening. It's as I was saying, and make it crash or unavailable. And it ranges from people using it for simple fun, for financial game or an ideology such as hacktivism or cyber crime or cyber warfare, the whole shebang, everything you think it is, it probably is. And then with distributed denial of service attacks, it's an attack that comes from multiple sources, but the set use of botnets. And it's the exact same thing, just with a lot more machines. Uh, so to give an example, what a DOS and a DDoS is, I've decided to use a lovely picture of Scott that I found of his brothers. Um, so this is the idea of a DOS attack where um, um, Scooty Mc, Scoot with the hat uh, is attacking an innocent little child and we will be calling the police someone eventually. And then the idea of a DDoS attack is poor little Scoot star about to never see the light of day again. May he rest in pieces, starfish pieces. So to give a basic, a bit of an idea why I'm here, um, I kind of want to talk about how DDoS was on the rise, uh, especially with this year, with the whole COVID pandemic, there's been a lot of more people inside. So as a result, there's been a lot of ways of um, a lot of increase of people on the net. And as a result, there's been a lot more attacks. To give sort of an idea, I was on the Caspery website. And uh, when I was reading through the Caspery website, I felt I was on many other websites. I was 
found that um, the DDoS had doubled by about nearly 80% 80, 80 more than what it originally was, where if you see on the graph here, where on the fourth quarter of 2000, or the first quarter of 2019, it's representing what it would have originally been back then. Then by the fourth quarter, by the end of the year, it obviously went very much down, because usually at the start of the year, there's a lot more DOS attacks. Uh, but by the first quarter of this year, because everybody was kind of, was basically going inside, DOS attacks jumped by a significant amount. Uh, along with this, there has also been an increase of the, the attacks have become a lot longer as a result. Uh, they've increased by the longevity of about 24%, as you can also see with the uh, graphs there, how they've just whooped way up. And lastly, uh, when it comes to all these sort of DOS attacks, there's a majority amount of just SIN flood attacks in general uh, in comparison to other attacks. So that's just for you people out there being like, oh, I wonder what's the most, you know, if it's ever in a pub quiz, you'll know. Uh, I'll forget because I forget things. <laughs> anyway, so going to give you, there's like several different ways of describing a DOS attack or a denial of service or a, a distributed denial of service, but it can be kind of just sort of put into three different ways. So the first one would be a volume-based attack, which basically would use a botnet to generate massive amounts of traffic to basically just clog the thing. Basically, just batter in that server until she goes down. Uh, they would send so many requests to the server, constantly just hitting it with information that it would just like, collapse. Examples of this being like a UDP flood or an ICMP flood, a HTTP flood, a Smurf attack or a DNS amplification, all that sort of stuff. Uh, next, we have a protocol attack, which basically the goal of that is basically kind of like the volume based one is it's, pro, it's job is to overload the server, but it would target you the network layers of the system. Examples of this would be a ping of debt, a Smurf DOS or DDoS, a SYN flood, all that sort of stuff. Last but not least, we have the application layer, which basically submits traffic to particular port protocols and would use a botnet to um, basically hone in toward, or use a botnet to send as much traffic as possible towards it. Examples of this would be get slash post floods or my absolute favorite thing of all time, low and slow attacks, but my absolute favorite attack that you'll find out in a few minutes. I'm not biased. This might have actually be the, the reason I wrote this entire talk because I wanted to originally do it for a college assignment and they said no. So I'm like, I'll show you. <laughs> uh, so before we actually start, I forgot about that gift. Uh, I just kind of want to give like a bit more detailed overview. So flooding attacks is your basic, your standard sort of like attack when a DOS attack. When you hear of a DOS, in a moment though. This stuff has been keeping me alive for 30 hours. I should stop. Um, when it comes to DOS, the kind of, when the first thing you think of, oh yeah, a DOS attack, you'd be just sending massive amount of information. That's sort of the flood attack that would be sort of the main idea you get. Uh, basically, as I was saying, the it's flooding the service with amount of data as you can. And basically it's aimed just to exhaust the system. Examples would be like I was saying, the HTTP flood, your ICMP, ping flood, UDP flood, SYN flood, et cetera. Uh, all the different types, just to sort of go a bit more extended, you would have uh, your SYN flood, which basically takes advantage of the three, the TCP three-way handshake. Or basically, if anybody knows networking, where you basically, you send like, a, like, hey, I want to connect to you, and it acknowledges you, and then you acknowledge that it's accepted you. Where instead of that, you just go like, hey, I want to connect. Uh, hey, I want to connect. 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 And the whole thing just gets terrified and then cries in the corner and uh, probably gets an alcohol addiction as a result. Uh, don't have to use your servers. They have alcohol problems. Um, the next one will be a HTTP flood, which basically is the same idea where um, when you're accessing a server, you're trying to get information, you would get a get command. Or if you're trying to post information, you'd be putting a, or like say, if you're posting a, on a form, you would send, it would send a post command. It would basically just keeps sending that information over and over and over and over until it gets scared again and also joins the, uh, the sin flood in the bar crying and thinking of the good old times when everybody left them alone late. Um, UDP flood is even worse. It's, um, in my opinion, it's worse because it's okay when somebody's like, it's okay, it's okay. But if they're just, they're flooding you from everywhere. They're flooding you in random ports. They're just causing the host to constantly check what the hell is going on, probably just, given some mental health problems to that server over there. Um, it would basically, when it doesn't know what's going on, it would replicate an, IC, an ICMP, which is ping, a destination on reach packet, and it would just sap as many resources and probably give it severe mental health issues. One can relate. Uh, an ICMP flood, it would overwhelm the attacker with the amount of the ping echoes as possible. It would generate traffic as fast as possible, considering pings are a lot easier to generate. 
uh, would generate them without writing or waiting for replies. I didn't write writing, whoops. Uh, and it would consume both the outcoming and incoming bandwidth. Uh, not a fun time. Don't hang out with these people. They'll ruin your life. Um, just also to give you an idea, an application attack, which is, I think is the coolest thing ever because it makes me always think of rock and roll music. Uh, an application attack, it would send a smaller bit of packets to say you're the attacker and you want to take down um, micklebrade.com. Please don't take down micklebrade.com. It doesn't exist, but you know. Um, you want to take that down. You would send, you would find something vulnerable on the net and you would send a little ping, a little tiny or little tiny bits of information to that, but you'd spoof the IP of the actual location of the, uh, the, the target that you want. So you send that little bit of an location and then the actual thing that gets sent is like, like a giant waking up being like, oh, what's going on? Send even heavier traffic. And if you were to do this, well, like even uh, like bigger amounts of ping, or bigger amounts of uh, data as a result. So you'd be sending, if you have a botnet, you could send little bits of data to these machines and then they would send massive amount of data to the target. Basically, it, as it says on the team, amplifying the actual attack as it is. Apologies. And as a result, that would overload the target. And examples of this would be your like, DNS amplification, your Smurf attack, your fraggle, fraggle, fraggle attack, et cetera. I know English is probably my first language. Um, an application attack, uh, just to sort of give you a few ideas of the types, there's DNS amplification, which is, uh, I might as well just say straight off, they all spoof the IP. So, you know, that's the easy part of remembering. So they'd spoof the IP of the victim and request access to the website via DNS. So your micklebraid.com or whatever com computer is getting overwhelmed by like all these DNS requests and possibly would cause the uh, victim to crash. A Smurf attack is the same thing, but with like ICMPs, so it would lead to the uh, the ping flood of the victim's computer. Fraggles attack, same idea, spoofing IP, what would UDP traffic instead of ICMP. Um, constantly just overwhelmed ICMP, or it would, it would overwhelm the router's broadcast address with, uh, with uh, UDP. Uh, the thing about Smurf attacks and Fraggle attacks, though, they're not exactly as prevalent or work as much anymore. Fraggle attacks are basically, in most routers, are completely harmless. I really don't want to regret saying that. Uh, and with Smurf attacks, there's yeah, probably one in a bazillion. So don't try that out. That's illegal. Uh, MTP no, ampli uh, amplification. I swear I don't have an amplifier right here, and I should just you know, know how to say amplifier. Um, MTP amplification, basically NTP is a, is a way of checking all that all the things in the network are synchronized on the same time, basically sending that to send massive amount of time data and scaring your computer and making it crash. So continuing on to that, my actual favorite subject would be the low and slow attack, or as I like to call it, slow ride, take it easy. I'm not singing the rest of it, you ain't paying me enough here. Uh, basically it's the aims of taking down the service quietly, uh, it aims to keep the connect all connections open by sending a little bit of data at a time. So it would send like a bit or two to a port and it would open the connections like, oh, we have a connection and it's waiting for the rest of the communication. So it's waiting, but there's a timeout sequence. And just before it's about to time out, it sends another bit of data. So it's like, imagine you're at home, you're going to bed and you're just about to fall asleep. And all you hear is a beep. You're like, what? And you're like, oh, it's fine. But you're constantly just hearing this beep over and over and over, but you, you really just, it annoys you so much that you eventually get angry and piss, get really pissed off. And even though there's only really soup, but it's the idea of just getting really pissed off in the server, just like, you know what, screw it. I'm going out, I'm going to the pub and I'm going to get really hammered and find when up in the ditch somewhere. So I'm really, I'm really like pushing my own problems onto these servers. <laughs> anyway, because of this, how this attack, all these attacks or the, uh, because it's only sending out a little bit of data at a time, you only need a smaller better bandwidth to actually perform these attacks. As a result, you could perform these attacks and probably just go about and just do whatever you want on your computer. Not that you should ever do these attacks unless it's within a control environment and you're just testing something. Um, these can go as well undetected originally for a very, very, very long time, considering it won't, your, uh, your DDoS uh, or DOS slash DDoS like mitigation tools wouldn't like catch this massive amount of traffic coming in. It wouldn't get fine. It'd be just like, oh, there's a little bit of better traffic. These are examples of these would be your slow Lars, which 
is my favorite attack of all time. There's the answer. Keep that one for the pub quiz at the end because it's not an answer there. There's also Rudy uh, and there's stock stress or sock stress, which is something I relate to. Right. I forgot my little thing. I had a little snail going along, but I was too into my own voice to actually let the little snail go by. So bye snail. You'll get there one day. Don't worry. Once I'm done this thing, I'll just watch the snail go by and nobody else will see it, but I'll know he's there. Uh, so as I was saying, slow Loris, the most adorable dot, the dos, adorable DOS name, or possibly the most adorable tack name in a distance. Don't at me. In fact, do send me the most adorable dot, like adorable tack names you can at mickleybray.com. Do it right now on Twitter, but actually after this conference. Um, it was originally created by Robert or Snake Hansen. Sorry for the docs there, mate, but it's all over the internet. So uh, basically, as I was kind of describing, it would event sound very slow HTTP requests, but like a single byte being all like, so basically like a letter, a letter every single time. And it's just like, this is, the server's like, this is great. I hate this. And I was saying it doesn't require a lot of bandwidth and Apache servers one and two were completely vulnerable to this. Notable use of this would have been in the dosing of the Irani government website in 2009 in protests to the Iranian presidential election, which I'm not going to get into. <laughs> um, my other favorite one, even though it's named after, funny enough, a different song, I've decided it's named after um, a message to you, Rudy, because it's every time I hear like, oh yeah, and are you dead yet? I'll hear da 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 because that's a great song. Um, Basically the same idea as a slow alarm, except it would send post information. So instead of trying to gather information, it would attack websites that have like places where you post data and would send small bits of that data at a time. And as a result, it would take out, it would take up majority of, it would take up all the ports it could. So probably should have extended further on the slow Lars and uh, Rudy thing, but like here we have the chance we're still in it. So I haven't failed yet. I'll get a C. Um, when it comes to actually sending the data, it would try to take up as many ports as possible to send all this little bit of information. And so as these resorts, these ports are getting clogged, um, they'd be sitting there waiting for any other information. And the only other connections would be like legitimate connections that are already connected. Once those connections leave, it'll go right in there. It's basically just taking up all the spots as it can. Um, it's like when you got one of your mates and he's lying across the couch and you're just like, this guy, um, he's that guy. But um Basically, it takes up all the spots until the point where your system, the system, the website is still running, yet just nobody can get into it because you've taken all the spots. You've parked every car in the parking lot. Um, as I was saying, this evades traditional anti-DOS anti -DOS systems due to not creating a high enough level of traffic or load of packets. Um, just to sort of go into sort of more stuff, like there's a lot of tools out there. There's, you, can, you can script it yourself. You can script all this sort of stuff, like prime example, the people who've made these tools scripted themselves. But if you wanted to, you could just use the tools that they, like it's already out there. There's loads of tools available out there being free, open source, or open source are paid for, but yeah. Uh, they go under like DDoS as a service. Um, each DDoS, DOS tool works in a very different way. Some of them are client-based, some of them are uh, GUI-based, and they use very, some, they use a lot of different attacks. Some of them use multiple different attacks. Some of them only specify on certain types of attacks. Examples of this be the PyLORS, which is a Python script that only focuses on uh, slow Lars attacks. Tor's Hammer, which we'll look into later, so I'm not going to get into it. Rudy, as we mentioned, da, 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 da. Um, <laughs> the low orbital ion cannon, which is everybody's favorite because it reminds me of Star Wars, or especially my favorite because it reminds me of Star Wars. And whenever I think of Star Wars, it's like, oh, boom, boom. Uh, <laughs> there's the HPing, which actually comes along with, uh, or now it's, I believe it's HPing 3. You can find it on Kali. Uh, I believe it is, from what I've used it for, it was an ICMP ping when I was writing my thesis. I didn't attack anybody. I swear it was a legitimate reason. And there's the OWASP DOS HTTP, pool, HTTP post tool. I did it, English. Um, so to go into the sort of the actual like tools, the Thor's Hammer, which um, just love the name of that, um, is a slow or, or sl low and slow HTTP post tool. Works a lot like uh, Ruby as, Rudy as a result, but it's a Python-based script. It allows users to use to go to the Thor network and by using native socks, sockets and proxy, proxies based within the Thor network, and it's completely client-based. Um, what? Slides have moved around. Great crack. Um, there is the low orbital on <laughs> Canon. Forgot about that gift. Um, 
it's considered an entry level tool by uh, by people who do the sort of the DOS sort of thing, you know, do that thing. Uh, it's one of the most popular DOS tools out there at the available at the moment, except for its older brother, the High Orbital Ion Cannon. Uh, Great entirely in C++ or C sharp, sorry. I swear I know coding languages too. Look, we can see how much he doesn't know. Yay. Um, you, the people who used to use it formerly would, use, would form uh, voluntary botnets by, with the use of an IRC. So people would have to volunteer and to join a particular botnet and then they'd all go and have a good old time breaking the law. Um, notable uses, it would be true anonymous. The one of their more notable campaigns would be like Operation Chinology an operation payback, which is basically they took down the uh, Church of Scientology website, uh, which I'm not going to get into because I don't want to get stalked. And they also have the took down the operation of mega upload or they, they did operation mega upload where they took down multiple companies like UMG, the United States Department of Defense, the US Copyright Office, the FBI, the MPAA, Warner Music Group and the RIAA. Some macarons you could tell I don't know. Uh, which basically they took that down because it was a lawsuit against Mega Upload and Anonymous believed that it was a it was the infringement on the freedom of uh, basically of, of art or the freedom of to gain art and the access of art. Um, there's a HTTP unbreakable load king, which I knew I was forgetting someone was going to put a little king on top of it. It's like, this is your crown, my king. Um, this generates a TCP uh, SYN flood and a HTTP flow, a GET floods written entirely in Python, and it can help you hide the user agent when you're sending all the packets. It sends as a, it sends different patterns of attacks and or it's, it changes around the attack actual style as to obfuscate the actual refer for each packet, and it's entirely client based. Um, Got to get into some ideas of actually attacks that actually took place. There is the GitHub DDoS attack, which happened about two years ago. Uh, it started at about 321. It used a vulnerability or it used a vulnerabilities within a machine called Memcache or Memcache. Uh, with that, they were able to perform amplification through the port 11211. Uh, it lasted for about eight minutes. GitHub was hit about twice, but the first attack was a lot harder than the first one. There's a joke in there somewhere. And it peaked at about 1.35 terabytes per second. Um, so give you an idea, because I realized I just said words and people are just like, ah, yes, I like your, uh, wait, I like your funny words, magic man. Um, basically give you an idea what actually, like they actually are. So, you, you know, being like, hey, he's saying words. Uh, meme cache was an, is an open source memory caching system. So basically um, it would sit within like a company and it would be sort of like an easier way to access uh, stored data, but only store about one, millibyte of data at each time. The problem with this though, is that people decided, hey, let's leave it on sort of an open, like leave it public facing, which is a terrible idea because there's no auth authentication on the actual system as a uh, like, because nobody ever intended, the creators never intended to have it on uh, exposed to the web, GG. Um, as a result of this happen, uh, there were so many already facing out towards the public and they had no authentication. So they were ripe for the spoils of all those little boys and girls on Christmas day. Um, so basically they would, um, they would use the um, amplification technique to send little bits of data through botnets and send a little bit of data to these meme cache servers. And that would result send a, a, a UDP packets of the size of 1,400 bytes to whatever target they want. And this result being GitHub, um, whatever happened, whatever ended up happening in the end, fix it, fix it, fix it, is what uh, they noticed it after about a few minutes. And what they did is they rerouted all their traffic to the, their Akami DDoS uh, scrubbing system, which basically what it does, it would detect all DDoS um, packets that are coming in and would drop all these packets. And as a result, they were able to recover by about 5.30. Um, there's actually a They've done an entire blog post about this. I would suggest looking into it yourself because I've only looked over it such a brief amount just to sort of get the thing going. But it's definitely like an interesting thing to look into as well. Um, they kept this routing though through that in the entire time just in case it kept hap it happened again, which it ended up did happening again, but it was already rooted through this. So they were gravy. Um, the next one is would be the AWS DDoS attack, which happened late early in the year. So uh, the clouds were under attack. Oh God, we need those. That's where the rain comes from. I've just annoyed every single cloud engineer and I'm so sorry. 
Um, I'm going to get an angry email. <laughs> um, this occurred in February 2020, right during the middle of the pandemic, cray crack. Uh, this was a reflection attack. Uh, it carried out it carried out this attack by using hijack CLDAP uh, servers, something which well, I'll explain what later in my lovely explain what words mean so people know what you're talking about there, Mick Labrade. Um, it's there was a three day elevated threat. It was it was treated as a three day elevated threat by uh, the AWS Shield, and they basically what they were doing they were targeting Active Directory servers and they ended up doing 2.3 terabytes per second of um, attack wise but that, that ended up getting blocked and the peak of it the peak was so much it was 44 percent larger than anything they had actually seen before um basically as i was saying uh i'm saying words again and i'm just people are just like ah yes i know what those words mean uh a connectionless a connectionless light rail directory access protocol or clidarp or clidap um is it's designated for um, accessing directories or directory services. And I wrote this down because I knew I'd come up to this. Or did I write it down? It's for referencing of management storage and data over IP. I make great notes, uh, as I put there. And the actual attack would um, basically work as the uh, amplification attack where it would send out the, it would, an attacker would send out like, um, data out to it and then it would re return the well spoof the IP and send the information out to the attack which in this place was AWS uh, but the thing about clouds though uh, they can scale they can get massive you ever seen what you ever looks like you're going outside you're having a lovely old day and all of a sudden massive cloud and it's raining not great crack basically that but computers um, basically as AWS plans and what they actually ended up doing as a result they have a plan for scaling where if they're under attack they can scale the server so big where they can just swallow the entire attack happening. Um, they also had to make sure that all the uh, connections that were going about were able to uh, handle all this traffic and the server capacity was up to scale and fast enough to be able to... Oh, that almost was a death of a Stratocaster. <laughs> Why are you here? You can stay. Um, basically, as I was saying before I got really interrupted, um, they, scaled, they would scale up fast and prevent resources from being used up and load balancers would prevent any overloading of any resources. So they're able to keep it going, eat the whole thing, and then continue on with their merry old AWS ways. Um, just to sort of give a, actually, can I go up to the one? Because I, I don't know how it got there. She, she's moving about. So there's mitigation techniques. Right. So the actual mitigating techniques that can be used would be, as I explained, we're like the cloud sort of stuff. I realized now that I originally had it there, then five minutes before the actual thing, I moved it up there and there was a reason. I'm very good at this. 30 hours of sleep. Don't do it, kids. Don't try to survive on six bottles of iron brew. Um, there is, they keep four, when it comes to cloud services, they keep four types of response or four stages of the response would be detection, response, routing, and adaption. So detection would be obviously finding, realizing that it's actually there. So we're like, oh, Oh, we're under attack, guys. Uh, response would be, we should do something about this. So they're responding to the incoming threat, like what they did with uh, what GitHub did by sending a true Akami and dropping all the packets there. And with routing, they route all the traffic away or route it through specific reports to break all the DDoS traffic to make it more consumable for the actual um, for the actual clet or the actual service. And they they would do an adaption. They would um, they'd look at the actual attack patterns and learn from this attack pattern and be able to learn how to protect against it in ways. With this, there's also the DDoS mitigation service, which would be they'd have scalability, flexibility, reliability, and network sizes. Um, scalability is, as I said, make cloud go big. Uh, flexibility is the ability to be able to adapt to the incoming threats at a time. Reliability is keeping the services up to a day to allow for maximum mitigation and network sizes be, if you have a larger network, you're harder to kill. So as I go all the way back down and make this look professional as hell, I have one final word to say about DOS and DDoS, and it's in a lovely song. So if you're ever thinking of performing a DOS or a DDoS against a company or ever thinking about joining a company or joining a group that wants to do a DOS, here's a song for you. Don't. My name is Mickle Braid. That's my time. These are all the resources that you can look at. Please ask me questions and be sure to follow me on LinkedIn. Super cool, Sean. <laughs> yeah, I can't really describe it as anything other than fantastic, really I spirited, really funny, that. hilarious, oh, but awesome. meaningful and full of really good content. Yeah, thank you. Brilliant, mate. 
really just, just, just. <laughs> That's the reply, by the way, Scott. That's the reply to the, yes, mine's don't. <laughs> I don't think any uh, right. Uh, we, I am the first musical guest. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Yes, you are. Uh, thank you so much for giving us your your talk. We're gonna jump to a holding screen real quick, but uh, yeah, we'll, we'll be. Oh wait, back. wait! I want to do one thing. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. Yeah, fantastic, oh. man. Thank you very much for that. Anyway, thank you. Cheers, cheers, pal. Thank you. <laughs>